Hello, I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about Buspar, the anti-anxiety agent. Can it be used to treat ADHD? So I'll start with my take-home message, and I'll be talking for about 20 minutes or so and be open to questions and answers at the end of that time. So the take-home message is that, yes, Buspar or Buspirone is an anti-anxiety medication. That's the only FDA indication. So why are we talking about an anti-anxiety medication that primarily acts, if you read anything about it, it's, we'll say it's a serotonin 1A receptor agonist. Why is that being talked about for ADHD? Well, for years, it's been on the lists of treatments that maybe is a third or fourth tier choice after the stimulants, after the other noradrenergic drugs like Welbutrin or Stichera, Atomoxetine, after guanfacine, after all those others, maybe you could try Buspar. But I would argue that there's actually, it's not a huge body, but some considerable number, small number of, of studies in humans and more data in rodents suggesting one, that Buspar can help directly with ADHD, and two, that it may be helpful for preventing some of the negative outcomes from stimulant medications so it could be used together. And there are neurochemical reasons why it's not bizarre to be thinking of this as a treatment for ADHD. So that's the take home message. Jumping along to what is Buspar? So Buspar chemically is called an azoparone. Um, there's several drugs in this class. I believe Buspar was the first worldwide to be a approved for any indication. Um, it was approved in 1986, specifically for generalized anxiety disorder. That's the only indication in the US for this drug. Some of the other esoperones are approved in other countries for depression. Some are approved for anxiety. At the end, depending on how much time I have, I will talk about Jeperone, um, Exua, which was approved in September, specifically for depression, not for anxiety. And if you read sort of the, the most of the summaries of what buspirone does, is they describe it as a serotonin 1A partial agonist. So it binds to, a, to the receptor, the 1A receptor of serotonin, and it activates at that receptor, or at least partially activates. And it turns out serotonin 1 receptors, 1A, are a complex group, and some of them are presynaptically present and some so be on the releasing side of the neurotransmitter, some are on the receiving side, the postsynaptic end. And buspirone has a preference apparently for the pre-receptive, pre, well, presynaptic receptors. And by binding there, it reduces firing of the serotonin nerves. That's the initial effect. But then over the course of several days to weeks, that winds up activating, boosting, upregulating your body makes more serotonin 1A receptors and it boosts the availability of serotonin and the release and firing of serotonin neurons, particularly in the amygdala and other limbic centers. That's, there are not complete understanding and agreement of how that works, but that's our simplistic level understanding of how it's helping with depression and anxiety and other drugs that seem to upregulate serotonin 1A systems do seem to have antidepressant effects. So as I said, Buspar was approved in 1986. In 2001, it went generic. A few years after that, the company making it actually stopped making brand names. So all the Buspirin on the market right now in the US is generic. And it was actually number 55 in the top meds used worldwide in one of the more recent years. So it's actually a fairly popular medicine. Why it's fairly popular for anxiety is it's working on, again, primarily we think the serotonin system there, unlike almost all our other anti-anxiety agents, which are working on the GABA system. So our benzodiazepines, the Valium, Ativan, Xanax drugs, alcohol, barbiturates, gabapentin, all are working on the GABA system. All of those seem to have some potential for addiction and tend to be sedating to different extents. Whereas buspirone is considered to be free of any addiction potential and relatively um, not sedating. So 
it's not completely free of side effects, although I can say clinically in the range of five to fifth, five to 60 milligrams, and usually or 15 to 60 milligrams, the vast majority of people I have worked with who've tried Buspirol and stayed with it um, have literally no effects. They can't even tell whether they took it a given day or not. Um, some people do have a little, I describe it as cloudiness. Um, a little, some, it can cause tinnitus ringing in the ears. It can cause nausea. I've never seen that. Um, so a little bit of sort of dizziness, spaciness is the only, actually that's the only thing I've seen over the years with it. And because buspirone has a short half-life on the order of just a few hours, it's commonly recommended as twice a day or three times a day dosing, which is inconvenient for anybody, but can be a particular um, deal breaker for many people with ADHD. On the and part of that, again, is because it's very rapidly metabolized and broken down into other drugs, other chemicals. That was a giveaway. And I'll be getting to in a second. Um, it's actually broken down into active metabolites that are far more prevalent and far more active than the buspirone itself. So one is that for drugs that are working slowly and indirecting, indirectly causing um, receptor activation or um, reproliferation or changes like that that take place over days at a time, we don't seem to need constant bombardment of those receptors. It needs to be a long enough signal, a clear enough signal, a robust enough signal, but you don't need, like when you're using an antibiotic, you want steady state drug levels or an anti-seizure medicine. You want coverage all the time because the action or the drugs is direct and you need it to be hitting those receptors or blocking whatever it's doing. With the drugs that are working indirectly that are causing activation of receptors or um, I'm blanking on a word right now, um, that are again, upregulation, downregulation of receptors, those you can usually get away with less than steady state, absolutely constant blood level so with the antidepressants, um, then the vaccine Effexor has a very short half-life. It was initially recommended as a multiple times a day drug and then made as a slow release form. We know that just once a day of the immediate release form works as well as multiple doses a day. So again, drugs that are working on upregulating, downregulating receptors seem in general to get away with that. And again, particularly with buspirone, when we're talking about buspirone, we're actually not even talking about buspirone. So circulating in your body, if you're taking buspirone, about less than two or 3% of the active buspirone-like action, including action on the serotonin 1A receptor system, is coming from buspirone. So some of the other metabolites, one of them is called 1,2-pyrimidinolpipirazine, um, 1PP for short. That's a strong alpha-2 antagonist, um, alpha-2 being referred to the noradrenergic system. So buspirone itself has some strong alpha-2 agonist property, but there's much more 1PP, probably 5 to 20 times as much as there is buspirone floating in your body. The alpha-2 agents that we have, one is remeron mirtazabine, which is a good antidepressant and helps with anxiety. Another is yohimbine, but um, strong alpha-2 antagonism seems to boost norepinephrine and dopamine as well as serotonin. And that's one plausible mechanism by which buspir, buspirone itself, but also primarily through 1PP, may be having a direct beneficial effect for ADHD, which when you boost norepinephrine and dopamine, that seems to have direct effects. Um, so one of the other major metabolites of buspirone is 6-hydroxybuspirone. There's 40 times more 6-hydroxybuspirone in someone's body than there is buspirone. And 6-hydroxybuspirone is itself a good serotonin 1A agonist. So when we're talking about what buspirone does, we're probably primarily talking about what its breakdown products, its metabolites do rather than the buspar itself. Um, so we have 
I've, I've mentioned the one serotonin 1A partial agonism. We have the alpha adrenergic antagonism, alpha 2 antagonism. And actually, the third major way that buspirone may have, have relevance to ADHD is what it was actually researched for to begin with. And they were designing it or hoping it would be a good antipsychotic because it is a dopamine blocking agent at dopamine 2 receptors, which is where certainly in the old days, most of our or all of our old antipsychotics worked. You would think, well, that would be opposite of what we want for an ADD agent where we're usually boosting dopamine. But it turns out that buspirone is actually better at blocking dopamine three and four receptors than it is at one or two, dopamine one or two receptors. And again, all of these chemical systems are complex feedback loops upregulating. So at least at low levels of buspirone, probably through D3 or D4 blockage, that's actually causing some increased output through dopaminergic systems and particularly in the nucleus accumbens, which are involved in reward, motivation, activation centers that seem implicated in ADHD. At bigger, higher levels, it probably is more blocking dopamine neurotransmission. So we have, again, at least three different pathways. Again, more of them are involving metabolites of buspirone than the bus are, are more potently involving. Um, so the few other clinical issues, the, the P450 liver enzyme system that's breaking down buspirone into these metabolites is the 3A4 system. Fortunately, that's one that not a huge number of other drugs interfere with, but one, so a few antifungals, a few other antibiotics do mess, um, Tegretol, I'm trying to remember one or two other drugs, um, Luvox interferes with 3A4, um, but grape juice is another one. So if you drink too much grape juice, you will inhibit P450 and you may wind up with more buspar and less 6-hydroxybuspirone and less 1PP in your body. So take it easy on the grapefruit if you're taking buspar. So separate from our neurochemical understanding, so some people have said, you know, yes, we know these are, buspirin's a good agent for generalized anxiety. There's a lot of overlap with anxiety and ADHD. Maybe all we're doing when we give it to people with ADHD is blocking the component of anxiety or helping with anxiety. That may be helpful for some people, um, but again, we do have these additional biochemical modes of action and careful assessment for anxiety and um, a number of um, measures for ADHD. It does seem to, and I'll, I'll be jumping to that in a second, it's, it does seem to be directly helping with ADHD. So a few other things, again, buspirone's approved uses, anxiety and specifically generalized anxiety, and it's used off-label, maybe half of it is actually adding onto an existing antidepressant to augment that, to make it work better. Again, many of our antidepressants seem to have an eventual common mode of action of upregulating that serotonin 1A receptor system. Um, other things that Buspar research and clinically has been shown to do, although I haven't seen it benefit that many patients in this regard, but when people are having sexual side effects from SSRIs, adding Buspar, um, at least statistically, is likely to lead to improvement in sexual side effects. Um, another important thing for what so many anti-anxiety agents are good for helping get through withdrawal effects from other agents. So if, if you're having alcohol withdrawals, actually usually benzodiazepines like clonopin are given clinically to prevent seizures and other problems. Or if you're withdrawing from a short acting benzo like Xanax, you may be put on clonopin or another long acting agent. But of note, even though the buspar is a good anti-anxiety agent, it's again, not having any effects on the GABA system. So it's not been shown to have any great use in reducing withdrawal symptoms from other anti-anxiety agents, again, which are chemically different class. So jumping into the buspar for ADHD, there are a number of studies, 
starting with some case reports, starting with some open trials where they just recruited 10, 12 people that showed very significant benefits of Buspar in people with ADHD and a range of ADHD symptoms, including inattention, impulsivity, hyperactivity, disruptive behavior, anger output, anger outbursts. Um, most of the studies, the benefits seem to arise over the course of several weeks. Many of them weren't designed to check if the result was faster. And in many of these studies, um, recovery or return of ADD symptoms happened within days to weeks after stopping the buspirone. Now, one thing, most of these studies were fairly small. Again, the, the most strongly positive ones tended to be open studies, but there were some placebo controlled studies. And the other thing is almost all the clinical work on abuse bar for ADHD is 20 to 30 years old. I think the first study was in 90 and many of those were late 90s or very early um, 2000s. Part of that is getting back to when did abuse bar go generic in I think 2001, I said. And unfortunately, it's still the case that most of the research on neurochemical benefits is coming from the drug companies who want to market for a certain condition. When it went generic, that incentive went out the window. On the other hand, one of the good things, so, so in addition to just studies looking at abuse bar, there have been a couple studies looking, doing head-to-head -head comparisons with Ritalin. And my summary would be, a very few study, and again, this isn't a big group of studies, a few studies showed comparable effects to Ritalin for treating ADHD. More studies seem to show benefit for treating ADHD, but not as strong a benefit as Ritalin, and a few showed, couldn't find a statistically significant benefit for um, buspirone, even though some of those, the results seem to be leaning that it was doing something. Most of those were in kids, as most of our ADHD research is, but there's one at least looking at buspirone in combination with adamoxetine stratera that was done in adults. Um, that one, there was a suggestion that adding buspar to stratera had some added benefit, but most of the um, endpoints were not statistically significant there. So in addition though to the human clinical data, which again, it, it's certainly more substantial than we have for ketamine and treating ADHD or for marijuana treating ADHD or for transcranial stimulation treating ADHD. So, so there is some good research out there. And what's continued in the years since the um, Clinical studies seem to have dried up. There's a number of studies on rats. And in rats and in humans, one of the thing, one of the consequences of long-term stimulant use, particularly looking at Ritalin, methylphenidate, is that there is downregulation of the serotonin 1A system. And experimentally, in rodents, a number of different studies have shown that giving buspar while you're giving Ritalin because again, the buspar upmodulates, upregulates the serotonin 1A systems, again, and systems. So, and many, at least in rodents, probably more, of the downsides of Ritalin seem to be attributable to this long term downregulation of serotonin 1A. So, there are studies showing this is one that's actually in humans, and I don't know if there's any in rats, but teeth grinding, which is called bruxism which is a uncommon but not rare side effect with stimulants, that buspar can stop that. Um, there's also in rats, and, and again, some of the animal research may not be particularly uh, um, translatable to humans or are, you know, we are not actually just big giant rats. Rats are not just tiny little humans. Um, but so liver toxicity has been seen with Ritalin in humans, but it's more common with rodents. That liver toxicity can be blocked by co-administration with buspar. Um, the growth inhibition, which is one of the most documented and pervasive effects in kids who are developing, so particularly a inch or a few centimeters difference in height, but in rodent models of that, the growth inhibition 
seems to be prevented by co-administration with buspar. Um, some both behavioral and neurochemical markers for propensity or potential for substance abuse seem to be diminished or rectified, corrected when you co-administer buspirone with methylphenidate. Again, this is in rodents and in rodents and in people. So, so the right dose, usually at the lower end of the spectrum helps with cognition, but too high a dose, too long a time with stimulants leads to some measures of cognitive dulling. And again, that effect as well seems to be blocked by buspirone. So I, having done this research and a lot of this was unfamiliar to me, um, I am much more inclined to be thinking about adding on buspirone to people who one, are worried about the risk of substance abuse or certainly two, if they're having bruxism teeth grinding or um, I'm not treating any kids right now, but if they were worried about growth inhibition, I would strongly encourage Buspar with a stimulant if you're doing the two together. So I have, I'm at 20 minutes. I think there are some questions. Um, I'll just say a word or two about Jeperone. So Jeperone is another Azoparone. It's in the same class as Buspirone. It's actually, we talked about the 1PP, which is the strong alpha-2 antagonist, um, adrenergic alpha-2 antagonist. Jeperone also gets broken down into 1PP. So it's very similar to Buspar. The company that makes it first applied for approval for depression to the FDA in 2002. Some of you weren't even born then and kept reapplying, reapplying. They submitted 15 different studies before the FDA deemed two of those studies. And that's all the FDA requires is two positive studies. It doesn't care how many negative or inconclusive studies there were. So Jeperone was finally approved. It's under the brand name Exua, E-X-X-U-U-A, in September of 2023, so just a few months ago. On GoodRx, I can't find any price data or anywhere else online, so I'm not even sure if it's in the stores. Supposedly it is, um, but it's, so it's out there now. Um, so I think that may generate more interest in using this class of agents for depression or anxiety, but for ADHD as well. So that's about all I'm gonna say, except for a lead in for next week when I will be talking more directly about just ADHD and anxiety in general. There's already a video in this series on ADHD and social anxiety, but I'll open up the anxiety front. So, hi Dennis. So, Dennis. So, Dennis mentions that his psychiatrist said that Buspar seems to work better for worry-based anxiety compared to fear-based anxiety. Um, so I'm trying to think clinically who I would classify one way or another. And I'm, I would say clinically, I'm not sure that I've seen a differential effect in Buspar and among the patients I've treated with it. Certainly some were sort of ruminative worry based anxiety, but some of them have been trauma based, I would say more fear based. And given that one of the, again, downline events of the serotonin 1A receptor and agonism uh, um, action on that does seem to be upregulation or more flow through of serotonin specifically in the amygdala, which is certainly a pathway that's intimately tied in with fear-based anxiety. I'm not aware. I, so that, that distinction may be true or valid, but just from what I know, I'm not either basic science wise or clinically finding a good reason to think that Buspar would work more in one realm or the other. I mean, I would, one of the things I would say clinically is that any of our anti-anxiety agents, there is a huge placebo effect, a feedback effect that if you expect or anticipate that it will work, that increases the likelihood it works. Um, and one huge advantage of the benzodiazepines over a slow acting agent, if you see it's helping 
immediately or within minutes or feel it, then that reinforces the likelihood it's going to work for you. So there's some evidence with buspirone that the more extensively someone has tried benzodiazepines before they try buspirone, the less likely the buspirone is going to work. And I don't think that that's primarily a neurochemical driving it. I think it's primarily, I'm making a false distinction, I'm aware. I think it's psychological that, that if you're used to something working right, so I guess I beat that answer to death. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions, but I'm glad you're back. Or I'm back interacting with you, Dennis, and I'm happy to answer questions that are sent to me in between sessions as well. I'll be back next Tuesday with ADHD and anxiety, and the two weeks from now it will be ADHD and well, stimulants and cardiac toxicity because there was a new um, new study fairly recently suggesting we there may be a more substantial risk there than we've been aware of. So stay healthy, stay happy. I hope you're not too cold wherever you are. Um, that's all. <laughs>